Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Inspiring and providing real insight to our listeners with every story. Exploring deep stories behind every guest. Please welcome your host, Bo Tiffany. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Voices. Today I have State Representative Christine Sinicki along with Phyllis Leavitt and Robert Mills back to talk about some discourse in politics along with um, other things going on more related to Wisconsin, but also nationally as well as those issues tend to uh, arise in every state. So with that, I'm going to hand this off to Robert. Morning, Robert. How are you today? <clears throat> good morning, Christine. Uh, good morning, morning. Phyllis. Good, good morning, Bo. Delighted to be with you again. Uh, congratulations, Phyllis, on your book. And uh, Christine, thank you. We're so delighted to have you here with us. Thank you. Um, you are one of those people who works um, where the rubber meets the road and where government is, is at its most important level. Um, and I want to start out with something sort of broad. Um, you know, as you look out at, at Wisconsin now and you look at the problems of Wisconsin, and you know, they say that politics is the, is the art of the possible. And there's a lot of things that I'm sure you would like to do and we would all like to do that are just not, not in the cards. But as you look out and you look at these challenges, um, which ones of those challenges that you see are susceptible to some sort of legislative fix or amelioration? And, and in terms of the priority of those, wh which ones do you think are the ones you'd like to take a crack at? And, and what can we do to fix it? Okay, that's a pretty lengthy <laughs> question. The first thing we have to do when we when we look at especially Wisconsin which is considered to be the most gerrymandered street state in the country, um, we need to fix the maps. Right now, there is no, um, there's no working across the aisle because the Republican caucus they know that they can get away with every, whatever they want to do. They don't need our votes. They don't need to talk to us about anything. They don't even talk to their constituents about things because we're gerrymandered so bad that they have complete control over any policy issues. So that's the number one thing we need to do, which we are currently uh, doing right now. In fact, our maps are in the Supreme Court, and we feel pretty confident that we will have new maps um, in 24. You're talking about and when, Wisconsin Supreme Court? Was, yeah, they're, they're in the Wisconsin Supreme Court, okay. which um, we just flipped. You're and four, uh, so you're four three now. We're three. We're four three. Yes. So we feel very confident <laughs> that we're going to get those maps changed. Um, and after we do that, and we have a fighting chance. Um, let me back up here a minute. When you look at historically Wisconsin's elections, our, we win, the Democrats win every statewide race, just about. And the Assembly Democrats, which is the house I'm in, historically get 250,000 more votes than the um, Republican Assembly members. But yet the Republicans hold two thirds of the seats. So that two shows thirds. you how, two thirds, yes. Shows you how horribly gerrymandered we actually are. Um, so once we get those maps fixed and we have a fighting chance to, to pick up seats, um, there is a lot we need to get done. When I look at what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years in Wisconsin, we have gone from being a um, really forward-thinking progressive state to a state uh, to a very backward state. We have repealed child labor laws. We have repealed workers' rights. Uh, we've, you know, along with the the um, what's happened nationally, um, we have repealed women's health care rights. So there's a lot that we need to to do in the coming years. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty uh, daunting. Um, it's very daunting, but we'll do it. You, you'll do, now, you, you don't have the initiative process there in Wisconsin, right? Um, no, in fact, um, we used to, up until a month ago, 
we did have the ability to do advisory referendums, county mm -hmm. by county. Republicans took that right away from the people of Wisconsin as well. Um, the only government entity that has the right to do initiatives is the uh, legislature. None of the locals have the, that ability. Wow. So the only the only fix really is is the Supreme Court, but that's like seems promising. It's very promising. Um, we just had the election in April. The candidate that we ran won by eleven points, which what? is huge. Points. Eleven points. Yes. <laughs> So that really sends a message that the people of Wisconsin are fed up and are tired of playing the games that they have been, that the Republicans have been playing. Um, however, in Wisconsin, the legislature does have impeachment power. And there's now talk of impeaching that new Supreme Court justice. Don't they because have there's some kind of. Uh... I guess I guess they could just claim that she's doing. They'll make something up, um, but I think if that should happen, if it came down to that, there would probably be a civil war in Wisconsin. Well, that's amazing. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> California was, <clears throat> excuse me, was was viewed as ungovernable just till recently, and was we, right. we were a big mess. And um, we passed two reforms. One was redistricting. Like like you're you're talking about yeah and uh, <clears throat> and the other one was a unitary primary where everybody has to run both all parties in one primary. Those two reforms dramatically revolutionized politics in the entire state of California. And ever since then, we, the, the moderate wins in the unitary primary, generally speaking, and uh, and the redistricting made all the all the all them competitive and made democracy work, and. It just fixed it all. I mean, and now everybody gets along and, and uh, it used to be the North hated the South. And, and now uh, we have a DA run here and then he went down, ran in L.A. and won. So, I mean, that tells you that it's just dramatically fixed. So I, I, that's that's there's there's hope for you, I guess, if you can get there. Yeah. Um, so looking at particular problems, I mean, are there several particular problems in Wisconsin that if you could, you would fix? And how would you fix them? Um, again, let's go back to, as like you're talking about um, voting and who's getting elected. We need to, when we get back in the majority, and I'm not going to say it's going to happen in the next election. It could take a couple of uh, cycles to, to get there. But we need to take, as you said, another, we need to take a look at our voting laws. Um, again, there have been a lot of changes to in our voting laws, which has severely restricted the rights of people to vote. Um, you know, they have taken away drop boxes. They have, um, for instance, we are a very strong early voting state. And they've, they've curbed that way back because what they found is um, Democrats or Democratic leaning people were, were the ones that were um, heavily relying on early voting. And so they have restricted that. For instance, if I'm going to go early vote, I can only take my ballot. I can't take my husband's ballot and drop it in the box, which which kind of um, holds back people, elderly people, people who don't drive, um, you know, shut-ins from taking advantage of early voting. So we need to take a look at, at those types of things. Voter ID, um, you know, Wisconsin used to be one of the easiest places to cast a vote. And now it's, it's, it's been so restricted that people are not voting. And we need to make sure everybody who is eligible to vote, who's registered to vote, um, has that opportunity to cast their ballot. So that's that's one of the, the big fixes we need to need to do. The other big fix uh, fixes that I really see is I work very heavily in um, on labor issues, and I I'm a very strong believer that um, organized labor is the backbone of any society. 
I mean, they built our societies. They, when they fight for something, they fight for every worker, whether you're a union worker or not. We need to um, repeal our Right to Work Act that was passed in 2011, and also um, what we call Act 10, which is the restricting of public employees being allowed to, to organize. Um, and I think that would do a lot for our economy. And the third thing we need to do is give our governor a little more power and leadway in how funds are being used. Um, I think those need to be some of the top things. Um, I think the women's health care issue is going to fix itself um, through the, the court system. Right now, Wisconsin has probably one of the most restrictive laws on the books when it comes to um, abortion rights. So well, that's... <laughs> I, I want I want to to, to you, you put some very important issues on the table there and and I, I think that you really are on top of that and I want to talk to you a second about you know how how we got here you know there's a <laughs> fascinating article this month in the Atlantic by David Brooks you know New York Times he called how, how did America get so mean <laughs> and he talks about how today the number of people that get kicked out of restaurants and the, the number of fights on airplanes and mm -hmm. just people having to you know just americans are just treating each other ghastly you know and there's this huge amount of anger and just ugliness out there and and he's trying to figure out why that is and in his article he argues that we stop teaching morality and we, we don't teach any kind of normative behavior to kids anymore. And you ask people, you know, what do you want to do? Used to be people said, I want to serve the world. I want to make the world better. Now they say, I just want to make a lot of money. And so, um, you know, the, so some people have said, you know, so what, what he's actually saying is that in addition to reading, writing, and arithmetic, we want to teach morality in, in, in schools. You know, that's, that's pretty controversial. Um, and, you know, there's another theory that, you know, the, the broken windows theory, which is a criminology theory that if you have broken windows and, and garbage in the streets and graffiti, that it creates a sense of disorder. And anything goes, and it invites more crime. And the proponents of that theory say that 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 Donald Trump is a broken window, and that he has normalized, um, you know, people being rude to each other. You sent that tweet the other day to Megan Rapinoe, the the the, uh, the 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 soccer player. You know, she lost, and and his nasty, gratuitous mm -hmm. thing, and you know, let's beat the crap out of journalists, and let's do all these things, all of which just sort of model. Uh, as a leader, uh, and, and so Brooks goes to great lengths talking about how obsessed we were in America the last two hundred years for for two hundred first two hundred years with morality and and exemplifying morals. And you know George Washington used to read these books on rectitude and try to conduct himself in a way because he was this leader. Uh, as is this is this something you see in Wisconsin that 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 we have a, a, a one of the political parties, uh, not to mention any names, but it starts with an R. Um, are are exemplifying you know behavior that's just nasty and it's it's the broken window that's inviting sort of the, the kind of notion that hey you know we we don't believe in democracy anymore we're gonna we're gonna uh, redistrict you out of existence um, <laughs> and you're not just our people just we disagree with you must be destroyed that kind of thing what, what do you think of that? Yeah, wow. <laughs> Um, first of all, I've always said you cannot legislate morality or common sense. Um, you know, you and I were raised in a time when parents taught us morals, common sense, kindness, love. And I mean, Robert, I don't know if you have any children, but I do I have two boys uh, who are adults now and two grandchildren. And I've taught my kids the same way I grew up. You know, you respect others. You, that's the way life is. But I think besides, when you look, well, we didn't get to the political issue next, but when you look at um, society, I think there's a lot of families, a lot of parents who were not taught that these days because, you know, the economy is forcing both parents to work for a living. There's nobody at home when these kids are coming home from school. They're learning what they're learning on the streets. Um, 
and it has to do with economics. It really does have to do with economics. It's a, it's a, it's a it seems to be a never ending cycle we're heading into that we cannot seem to break. Um, I mean, that's what about, we, uh, uh, just the schools for a second here, you know, and when yeah. I went to school back before the ice age, um, at elementary school, <clears throat> they, 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 they taught morals. I don't mean in the, in the political sense or in the right. religious sense, you know, you don't cut in line. You don't right. call people mad names. You give your seat to an elderly woman. You, you're you're respectful to to people. I mean, just this basic manners. Basically, right. we were taught that in school. And so, since you're pointing out that that economically, you know, we really can't put this on 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 families uh, entirely, and and maybe it isn't even possible. And, you know, maybe this it's a it's a a public duty to teach something we got to put a name on it doesn't sound political but you know teach people how to get along with you not to be mean to each other you know does right. that, that make sense no that makes perfect sense because as you said i mean that used to be taught in schools i mean it's like you said my remember my teachers teaching us you don't skip in front of people you don't hit other kids you know that kind of thing you you you're polite to your elders um but I think as far as education goes right now, we have put so much on, on teachers. They don't have, number one, they don't have time for that. Number two, there are parents out there that if a teacher even gets a little bit out of line in their minds and says, you know, Johnny, um, you know, Johnny said a bad word. A lot of parents don't I hate to say this, it's not a big deal to them anymore. Whereas when I was a kid, my mother would be right there at that school, you know, um, in the principal's office with me. And we don't see that anymore. I think we've put so much on teachers' plates that they just don't have the time and they don't have the support to 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 actually teach kids right from wrong anymore, I think. Do, do you agree with me that that this this issue we're just we're talking about now is 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 fundamental? It's it's more fundamental than the redistricting because it leads to people you know, not not being willing to give you a fair you know, a subverting democracy and right. feeling that's I I can legitimately because I can cut in line here I can deprive you of a vote that, that, that motivates people to behave that way in the first place, you know. Yeah, I think um, I think what they're learning as children, and like you said, it's 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 feeded into our democracy now. Um, I'll be honest; I am probably one of the older members of the legislature. Um, I like to call myself self seasoned, not old, but I see these these young ones coming in, and that's where I see there is no respect. Just Last a couple of weeks ago, I was at an event and um, they were short seats. One of my young colleagues, male colleagues, offered me his seat. The guy sitting next to me, who is 19 years old, refused to get up and give anybody else his seat. And I looked at him and I said, Who raised you? But that's what we're seeing. And so it is. It's spilling out into the workplaces, into politics, into our democracy, because now it's every man for himself. I'd like to uh, get some perspective from Phyllis. I think this is one of the reasons why she wrote her books. Absolutely. I was going to just jump in there. So thank you. Yeah, because um, I think uh, a very a less, maybe a less um, triggering way and perspective to look at that is through the lens of psychology and rather than morality. Um, not, not that morality isn't certainly an important issue, but I think psychology by its very nature is nonpartisan. And what we're talking about is a real deficit and a decline in our collective mental health. Mm -hmm. Mentally healthy people don't behave in some of the ways that we're seeing proliferated at the highest levels of authority. And so one of the one of the underlying themes of my book is that these are abuse dynamics. Abusers 
take away the rights and privileges and the voice of those that they try to dominate, and subjugate and exploit and use for their own purposes. And that's what we're looking at here is an abuse dynamic that is coming down from the top, that is being role modeled for our children, that it's okay to spit at people, call them horrible names mm -hmm. and cages because of whatever justification. And that's exactly what abusers do. They justify the abuse by blaming their victims. And that's what we're seeing happening in our country. And as a psychotherapist of many, many years and having worked with families and individuals and children and couples, um, and I've said this before on many of the talks that I've given, abuse in our country on the family level is epidemic. And I think I think, Christine, you've pinpointed some of the main stressors that are feeding into that. Parents are stressed. They they don't make a living. They don't have role models even for marriage relationships. Um, they bring all their stresses home to their spouses and children. And it's really the family of America context around them that is creating so much of the pain that then gets acted out on an individual level and then get, gets carried with all those unhealed people into their adulthood. And if some of them run for office, then they have the authority mm -hmm. to situate those exact dynamics. So that's- uh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just gonna ask, Chris, if you had, you know, I, I, you know, Phyllis has really hit the, hit a very key point here. And and have you had personal experience with with, with behaviors that, that, that like this, that that were people behaving mm -hmm. toward you as a representative? Could you share some of that with us? Sure. Um, I mean, the most recent one is I was helping out at the Democratic booth at the Wisconsin State Fair. And, um, you know, we usually have people that will come up and, you know, either say something really childish or, you know, which we tend to just say, you know, just move on. But there, there were several people <laughs> that came up to that booth that were just as Phyllis put it, abusive. I had one older gentleman walk up to the booth and um, started talking to me about the president and Hunter Biden and how the president's guilty of, you know, um, you know, whatever. I don't know what he was trying to say he was guilty of. And I said, well, you know, there's really no proof that the president has had anything to do with the Hunter Biden case. I said, but what there is proof of is the former president tried to steal the election. And he got very hot about it and started yelling at me that it was the Democrats that stole the election. And um, I was very calm trying to reason with him, which was a, probably not the, you know, I should have just left him go. But in the end, he called me in F and B and spit on me. Oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, and then, yeah, he, when I said, when I said to another woman that was in the booth, I said, call the police right now. He took off. And um, earlier last night, I did send everybody a video of the event that took place in a small town in Wisconsin. It was a LGBTQ plus pride event where a bunch of neo-Nazis showed up and just, I mean, they, they just started hollering the most horrible, disgusting things that I cried watching it, that we have come to this. And the thing about it is they didn't have the guts to even show their faces. But I do think in the past, what, eight, eight years or so, well, let's say since the former president took office and before that, People, we've always known these people were out there, but they never, we didn't know really who they were. They were always in the shadows. And now it's been normalized. It's been so, normalized. So Chrissy, you, you, you said that you're, you're seasoned. Um, you, you look awfully young to me, but um, it, this is new behavior, right? You, you, you have been around long enough to see this is, this is not something that happened until just mm -hmm. recently. Is that right? That's right. When I was elected to the legislature 25 years ago, we could actually work across the aisle. We socialized across the aisle. We had friendships that we created across the aisle. And 
I have seen this, the change started gradually. Um, and when it got really, really bad again was when the former president came in. Um, and everybody thought it was perfectly all right to behave in that manner. And I see that now in, in our state legislature. Um, they, I would invite you at some point to go to wisconsini.org um, and just watch some of our floor sessions. Mm -hmm. Because the things that are said on that floor are just incredible. And we've got people in leadership in our house who will just sit back and let it happen. And that is not the way our government is supposed to function, and it's sure not the way a democracy is supposed to, supposed Phyllis, to function. Let me ask you here, you're an expert in altering behavior, trying to improve behavior and fix behavior. What, what, what solutions, if any, do, do you see, uh, you know, that could be, uh, that are feasible that might turn the tide on some of this stuff? Well, the first thing is to call it out for what it is. And that's one of the main reasons why I wrote my book, because it's actually psychological, physical, mental, political, justice, gender, economic abuse. It's abuse of people. And it's being touted as ideological differences, as, you know, entitlement issues, you name it. Um, but but the bottom line is it's being justified along political lines or ideological lines when actually it's abuse behavior. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I wrote my book is because I don't know that the average person actually knows that because we're so indoctrinated to believe that these are ideological issues and that some people deserve terrible treatment. And when that's role modeled from people in power, whether it's an individual in a family or a legislator or a president, it has a devastating effect on the family, whether, and again, whether it's the individual family or the family of America. I have worked with so many families over the years and one of, and there are many, but one of the things that destroys a family is constant fighting with no commitment to resolution. And I think that what we're seeing from the top is exactly that. It's, it's I'm going to beat you rather than I'm going to work it out with you. And this is very disturbed psychological behavior. It's, it's almost what we would say, like children on the playground, we ask them to work it out. Right. But we're not role modeling that on so many levels in our country. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. It's, what, it's, what can we do about it? What, are yeah. there solutions you can see? Yeah. I mean, I think I mean, there are many solutions. And if, if we start with informing people and educating people about what is happening and then what is needed. So one of the things that I propose in my book and there, there could be a million um, is that we actually create um, mediation in Congress, that we have professional mediators that are there to moderate the conversation, not allow people to act out on each other, set the stage for um, cooperation. And again, this would take a populace that was willing to vote for that. So, you know, so I don't see that happening overnight, but I see it as something that is not impossible because everything that we do on an individual level, we can do on a group level. There's nothing to stop us except the will to do it. And so, but, you know, putting these ideas out, having trained professionals have people talk with respect. You know, when, when someone comes into, a couple comes into an office for therapy, obviously they're coming because they want help. And I don't know that there are a lot of people out there in positions of power right now who do want help. Um, they would have to be mandated to look for help probably. Um, or we'd have to elect a different governing body, you know, that that was open to the, the principles of, of resolution. But that's what's not happening. The goal of resolution, what you're talking about across the aisles, is that's how people come together. They listen, they might disagree, they might adamantly disagree, but the goal is to cooperate and find some mutual ground to stand on. 
And it's not just for the sake of winning an argument or getting more of what you want. It's actually for the sake of the mental health of this country, because the people in this country are suffering from the hostility, the violent rhetoric, and we see it. I mean, it's not an accident that there are more mass shootings. This is a symptom of deep underlying causes of alienation and hatred and discrimination and lack of resources that so many people are suffering from. So, so, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book are, you know, what it takes to get people to sit down together. You, we don't allow people in therapy to call each other names. Right. Well, just, I, let, let me, let me uh, right? ind indicate that, uh, you know, how, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I I think that you really have hit upon something here that is I I never thought of that that um, <clears throat> your your mediation idea, it, what a, what a tremendous uh, idea that inspiring idea. I worked for decades as a, as a trial lawyer in in litigation, and there are judges who became mediators, mm. and they they charge a lot of money, thousand bucks an hour to be the mediators, and. I was shocked again and again at how effective they were. I mean, right. they got people who couldn't see in the same room. They hated each other with every cell in their body, and they couldn't even talk to each other. These judges would have them hugging each other and singing from the same sheet of music and harmony in about four hours, you know? And so it, it mediation works. It works in ways that the people who do it don't even imagine it's going to be that successful. Uh, but it, it, a good skilled therapist or mediator, you probably witness this all the time, can achieve things that the, the people who go into it can't imagine is even possible. Absolutely. So, go ahead. That, that, that's 100%. What I want to say is because one of the skills of a good therapist or a good mediator is they set the ground rules and they create the stage for each person to be actually heard on a deep level. So that because, you know, and I've, I've cited this several times and I'll say it really quickly. I knew a mediator in Santa Fe many years ago, Craig Barnes, who passed away. And I went to a talk that he gave and he was an international mediator. And he said that the bottom line of what always worked for him when he was in very difficult mediating situations with with, you know, warlike people um, was that he had them talk about their pain the families that they had lost, the children that had been killed, the churches that had been destroyed, the, you know, whatever, the heritage that had been maligned. And when he could get people to hear each other's pain, he had a foundation to bring them together because he's- Chris, do you think that we could, we could get something like this through the legislature? We could do it if, if people know that it's even possible. If, I mean, I think many, many people in this country, and I don't have statistics, are sick of what's going on and they want something new. I think people want to be taken care of. I think they want our government to be looking out for the needs of the average person instead of all this high drama and violence and you know one-upmanship and whatever is going on. I, I really think many people want that, but I also think many people feel helpless. So one thing that I agree with uh, is that people are people. We said that in our other podcasts, um, you know, that we worked on together, Phyllis and Robert. And it doesn't matter if you're a priest or a politician or a teacher, we all have those basic human dynamics. One of the things that I've evolved or I've grown up seeing evolve is the Jerry Springers and the Murray Holdings. And that almost drove a counterculture and people wanted to get on to the show to fight you know and it became idolized um i started to see that spread through other things as well and now we're seeing it in our politics and going along with that people are people you know i think a lot of this garbage garbage in garbage out you know and it's a trickle effect that doesn't necessarily happen overnight um Another thing I wanted to interject is that, you know, a lot of these ideas are generational. Um, and so as this older generation is now uh, either retiring or, or leaving office, now we're getting this fresh meat, if you will, 
that carries all of this hostility, uh, you know, the garbage in, garbage out. During my childhood, we had a lot more um, wholesome programs and a lot less shoot them up uh, sadistic mm -hmm. programming. Um, now we have such extremes because we'll get used to it and we start to desensitize to it. So I totally agree. Um, you know, mediation would be a, a good start um, if that somehow could be get, you know brought in. You know, we do it for political um, debates. I can't see why it wouldn't work for other types of forums. Um, but we also just to kind of circle to my point. We need to start getting rid of the garbage that we're feeding our people and start feeding them with more wholesome um, mm -hmm. things that you know withhold and uphold the values that we have as Americans. I get the floor to you guys. Can I add one more dimension to that? Because I think, and I talk about this in great depth in my book, which I probably can't go into here, but I think one of the reasons why we're seeing such an uptick in uh people gravitating toward violence and hatred and acting it out without any compunction is that actually so many people in America feel powerless. Powerless to feel valued, powerless to get their needs met, powerless to find adequate employment or housing or health care or education. And the more people feel powerless, the more some part of that population is going to act out with rage. And they're going to look for who to gather around who will support their rage and encourage their rage and feed their rage. And that is a psychological issue. The family of America is leaving millions of people without what they need and they're angry and if i could add just one piece mm -hmm. of that too you know there's the reality beyond the perspective so you might feel that way but then you think oh the reality is different but when you actually find out that the reality is that way and there are these roadblocks and there are these preventions that's where the despair and right. and, and such creep in and what happens on a psychological level is you have some people who are willing to go into their rage and act it out, and you have other people who are so feel so helpless and so dominated that they don't stand up, that they don't know how to protect themselves. And the more that this dynamic escalates in our country, the more you have people who are willing to dominate in a violent way and people who are able to be subdued, and that is really dangerous. And if I could, Phil, that actually goes back to the whole um, cycle that I'm talking about. That cycle needs to be broken. And how do we do that? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, there is no easy fix, but I think I really think information is the first step. I think people have to be informed that this is actually what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I've given this example a million times. I had a woman come to therapy who had been abused her entire childhood and was still being abused by her family as an adult. She was suffering massive anxiety, didn't know why, thought that she was a failed human being. And I looked at her and I said, you are being abused. She did not know. And a light bulb went off, you know, and then we could work on finding some power in her to stand up. And, and that's the challenge is how do you stand up without becoming the aggressor? How do you stand for truth and justice and equality or whatever it is you're fighting for without becoming like those who have implemented mm -hmm. harm in the first place? And that's a psychological, that's an issue of psychological development and strength and the first place to begin is with our own wounds because to the extent that we're unhealed we act them out and so you know another thing is like put those billions of dollars that are going into nuclear weapons into mental health into education into resources for families into treatment into you know free health care <laughs> there's a million <laughs> There's a million ways we could address this when basically what it means is people come first. Yeah. You know, what I'd like to hear uh, from you, Christine, I've known you now for you know, several years and mm -hmm. seen you fight the good battles, but I, I see, you know, the two steps forward, two steps back sometimes. And it seems so frustrating from 
a viewer standpoint, I can only imagine what you're going through. How do you feel about um, that? I mean, is it, do you, how much progress truly is made versus, you know, standing two steps forward, two steps back, which really keeps us in the same spot? It is very frustrating to me. Um, so I'm the only member of my caucus who's ever been in the majority. So a lot of my colleagues don't know what it's like to actually get something done. They think that this is the way it's always been. You know, it's like, we just go there, we, you know, we let them walk all over us, walk all over our issues, walk all over the things we care about, walk all over, you know, the people that we care about. They think this is the way it always is. And it's so frustrating. Um, I mean, I, Bo, I think you know this, I tend to be a little outgoing <laughs> and I tend to say what's on my mind. And I will tell you, I am not one to sit in the assembly chamber and allow them to do what they're doing to certain communities without firing back. And I know some of my colleagues, you know, are like, oh, there she goes again. But it's things that have to be said. They need to know that what they're doing is wrong. They need to know that there are people out there that need our help. And they just keep ignoring it. In Wisconsin, we have a $7 billion surplus. That mm -hmm. money should be going into mental health care. That money should be going into education. That money should be going into workplace housing. That money should be going to support those who need our help. Now, I'm not one to say, you know, you should live off the government for your entire life, but there are times when people need a hand up. But yet we're not seeing that. And that's where my frustration comes from. My frustration also comes from the fact that we have leadership in the assembly that actually thinks that what is happening right now is funny. It's funny that, that we have this discourse and we are going back and forth and just coming up short of, of cussing each other out on the floor of the assembly. Um, I don't know how, I mean, Phyllis talks about mediation. I don't know how you mediate with somebody who does not believe that what they're doing is wrong. So I don't know how we address it, except through elections um, and just keep fighting for what we think is right. Is there any kind of... Uh organization or agency out there that keeps metrics on states on how well they get along like you know what states have more discourse than others and in conflict than others and you know maybe that kind of metric might help because then it gives somebody you know if they're showing up at the bottom of 50 or whatever then you know due to pride at loan you know they'll want to improve i would think is there any Anything like that, keeping track of, of the behind the scenes? I don't know if there's any group keeping track of that, but it would be interesting. We do have two national groups that support state legislators. Um, the National Conference of State Legislators, um, and they do a lot of data on different aspects of the legislatures. I'd have to have somebody check into that, see if there is any data on that. And also the Council of State Governments, um, which is another support group for, for legislators. Um, so I could check into that. I'm not sure if there's ever been any type of data kept. Do you feel like if you got a report card, you know, for your state on how well you, uh, your state has worked together in terms of the officials and, and being able to pass legislation, if there was some kind of report card that was given, would that inspire people to do better? You know, I think it actually could. 
um, especially with the National Council of State Legislators. Um, it's a highly respected organization. The only problem with with that one, if you know, I mean, well, they might pay. They actually, it might be paid attention to. Our speaker, Robin Boss, is the current president of NCSL, so he might pay attention to that one. But he is one of the worst offenders when it comes to um, this type of discourse. Is he a Republican? So, pardon me. Is, is he a Republican? He's a Republican. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's very smart and very mean. And um, he's, uh, to, in my mind, that can make him very dangerous. It's felt like people are competitive by nature. And if they're being judged and have a report card and they're being, you know, compared to their peers, um, you know, that might inspire people to do more or do better just because of that competitive nature. Yeah, I, I know it would inspire me. I'd be like, ooh, I gotta, yeah, take a look at what I'm doing here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we've talked about the Marjorie Taylor Greens. We talked a lot about the discourse. Um, Robert, you had some other things that you wanted to tackle on this podcast. You want to bring us into the next topic? Uh, well, I, I have I have felt that that um, uh, apropos this whole discussion here and the things that Phyllis has mentioned and Christine has mentioned that. Um, you know, what, what we have are legislators and in, in the ecology of the Republican Party uh, and, and the media ecology that exists today. There's a dynamic that if you're extreme and you say outrageous stuff, uh, you get money, you know. And so the, the people who move out to the fringes and, and yell the loudest are the ones that get, get media attention and they get money. And so <clears throat> that's a very unhealthy dynamic. And that is well the way this whole system working right now um and you know it, the, if you're you're boring and you just do you just talk about legitimate you know how, how do we fix the potholes and you know help families and and do the stuff of legislation that's boring you know let's let's attack um i was talking to a friend last night about this and, and he he had this whole theory you know apropos we we're talking about um uh you know what what what's causing all he, he thinks that there's a um, World Wrestling Wrestling Federation, World Wrestling, um, you know, analogy here. He says that that people know it's fake, but somehow they like to watch this, you know, and it kind of acts out some catharsis to see all this fighting going on, on, on you know, and you know, there's some element of that, you know, uh, it, it, Phyllis, you might have a better understanding of of the dynamic, but. You know, as people watch the the the, the, the fights uh, between politicians, th there is this element. They just like to watch, you know, you know the the fake, you know, fight. You know, they like the fight of it rather than you know the substance of it. And this is our self government. The, the, we have problems. This is how we fix them. That that's boring to some people, and and so we've gotten this dynamic where the ugly people, you know, and who, who are rude like this, I mean, and, and that's all part of a mm -hmm. deterioration of our broader culture, the, the one that that um, David Brooks is talking about, where we, we, we no longer care about morality and fairness and doing the right thing and all that, that's just boring. And, and what we're talking about is winning and, and, and owning the libs and things yeah. like that. That's what gets people excited. And against that backdrop and against this ecology of fundraising and how people get attention in the media and so forth. Uh, and, you know, and I think there's an even a more underlying thing, you know, evolutionarily, human beings are wired to pay attention to threats and to be motivated by anger. And, you know, Richard Valkyrie started this fundraising back in the 50s for the Republicans, talking about fluoridated water and the communists everywhere. And he, he, they're out to get you. And to everyone's surprise, he raised millions and millions of dollars by mm -hmm. writing these very far-right, conspiracy-laden things that the, 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 the other side, these mysterious people are out to get you, this conspiracy. And so he, he set the stage for now, and then the social media algorithms on Facebook and the others did the same thing. The, the, the posts that make people angry, that, that they're coming to get you, that, that, that evoke emotions, you know, that goes into our basic DNA, you know, there's a mastodon coming up, we got to do something. 
from from our prehistoric it, it stick and so people it, these studies show and of course the, the the facts show that those are the ads and those are the pitches that get clicks that get money that people write checks for mm -hmm. and so that's become to dominate our national discourse and the and the bottom line is it's it's really it's pulling us down um and uh, and so you know, we, I think there's a recognition, and you recognize it, Christine, that, that, that you know, Trump is the broken window and, and that all these politicians mm -hmm. doing this are broken windows that are creating a sense of disorder. They're, they're the equivalent of the trash in the, trash in the streets and, and uh, graffiti and broken windows that tell people, young people and, and everybody, it's okay to be rude. It's okay to be threatening. It's okay to be nasty. In fact, that there's this, uh, you know, people like the meanness, you know, and so, you know, how do we fix this? You know, I, I think that Christine's really on something, mediation, you know, people who don't, who aren't willing to fix it, don't recognize these things. You get them in a room with a mediator, um, things happen that would never happen otherwise. Now, I don't know whether that model from litigation is transferable over into life because they have these other pressures, they leave you know, the, the, the mediator in, in, a, in a litigation case has people locked in a room where they they're, they're, they have to deal with each other and they can't leave and, and he's got something. They want to settle this case. Um, and so there is a dynamic and a relationship that doesn't really quite exist in the legislature. So I don't know if that model, I know the model works in that context. It works to a degree that people will be shocked how well it works. Um, and I'll, I'll bet you Phyllis manages to get people uh, to solve, you know, get couples who are, so, you know, about to divorce back together. If you, if both the party will sit down in a room and do it, whether that works in the legislature with the, with the, with the head people where it's a game, like you say, they're, they're having fun with it. Um, and they think it's funny to, to, to call each other names, you know, it, it maybe is too far gone to work in that model there. So, you know, I, I, I don't know how to solve it. I think we, 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 we're we making a lot of steps here in understanding it and what's causing it, where it came from. And, uh, you know, how did America get so mean? That's the title of Brooks's article. Um, and, you know, we, we now have a better understanding of it from this, from this podcast, but, you know, the specific uh, you know, we, I, I, that, that may be the next podcast, you know, how, how do we, you know, what are concrete steps that we can take to try to fix this? You know, it's not going to be easy. Phyllis, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have lots. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we if we research the 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 history of one school shooter and we find and I'm not talking about a specific individual here, but in general, what we have found is that these are young people who have been alienated, bullied, they've had addicted parents, mm -hmm. foster care that was abusive or you know they they've they've not had the basics of love and connection and safety and being provided for that we require to become healthy human beings and if that's true then we know what needs to be addressed we know that families need help we know we need to invest in um the whole drug problem and and um and family health and well-being and not criminalize it but address it as how we heal these, how we help people, how we how we work with addiction and incarceration and rehabilitation and poverty as, as a goal to heal people, not blame them and outcast them. Mm -hmm. so know these things on the individual level. And I, I, I wanted to backtrack and just give you an example out of my individual work that I think speaks to some of what you're talking about, Robert, like about part of why people are so addicted to meanness and why they get so much pleasure from it. I had a client that was terribly, terribly abused as a child. And I've had many clients that were terribly abused as children. Um, and he was, he loved sadistic thrillers. That's what he watched. He loved them and he got off on the pain and the violence. And as he did the work, on his own abuse and some torturous mental and physical and sexual abuse that he had sustained as a child, that desire disappeared. And in fact, those kinds of movies were, he couldn't even look at them because he was healing the pain of what happened to him. And I think we have 
also that's a contributing factor that people are in pain and they project that pain out onto the world around them and they get off on seeing somebody else in pain because it displaces their own. And these are very deep psychological issues that, again, I don't know that the average person is aware of. We're not born mean. Nobody is born mean. We learn that from the conditions that we receive. And we let me, let me bring and another we, d- d- dimension in here, and that is um, uh, the media. Uh, and, and I'm in specific talking about Fox News. Um, you, you know, I, if you turn on Fox News, it, it's all about Hunter Biden and, and you know, the, you know, just all this. Th- there's nothing ever that suggests this, that anything is done. The, the Republicans have anything wrong. There's any problems. It's all these liberals trying to destroy the world. And people who grow, who, who are who are addicted, that that becomes the sole source of all information about reality. They have this sewage pipe down their throat, and that is it. That's all they ever hear. And so this creates mm-hmm. a huge problem in solving these, th- this problem that we're all talking about here, and particularly for you, Christine, because you know when you get up and give a, a speech on the floor of the legislature, you know the, the, the people whose, whose sole source of information about the world is that sewage pipe are never going to hear you, what you have to say. And so how do you penetrate that, you know, and the people call it an alternate source of reality. There's only one reality, okay? Two and two is always going to be four. And, you know, it's not, it's an alternate unreality that they have. And how, how do you penetrate that so they can hear you? Okay, so to be honest with you, when we get up to speak on the floor, we know they're not hearing us. We know they're not listening. Our goal is to get our message out to the people of Wisconsin so that they understand what is happening here. I mean, there have been times when I've gotten up to speak on the floor and the entire, that side of the entire chamber is empty because they're either in the parlor eating something or they're in their office doing something. They're not there because they don't, they feel they don't have to listen to us. They don't have to talk to us. We're just there as wallflowers at this point. So when we get up on the floor with a message, it's really not to them because their minds are made up. When they're going to take a vote, they are lockstep. They do not get out of line or they will be primaried. So we're not going to change any minds we're just trying to get our message out to people so they know what is happening in the state of Wisconsin. Is there any way to get around that? I mean, any way to, 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 to go around this media ecology and actually communicate with those, those voters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we all, I mean, I hold um, town hall meetings. I have weekly, or I'm sorry, uh, monthly office hours in the district um, where, you know, people can come to me and, you know, I can help them with their, their issues personally. Um, we do a lot, you know, we have to, we have to resort a lot to social media. Um, you know, cause let's be honest, the media is only going to pick up, you know, 10 seconds of a floor speech. So that direct contact with the people that I represent is the best way for me to, to get my word out. I mean, I have to be really fortunate. I represent a community in which I have lived my entire life in. So I'm very well known in my district and people are, people know I, I'm very open. I've had people come knock on my door to talk to me, but that is the best way for us to, to communicate about what is really transpiring here. Because if you listen to what they have to say, what the Republicans have to say, everything's rosy. <laughs> you know, did, they did have the Republicans ever people. come? Do you ever have, have people on the other side of the aisle ever come to your, your oh, yeah. time? Oh, yes. Yep. Uh, many times. And I'll be honest, I have um, quite a few Republican friends. Um, there is... But none of those Republican friends are Trumpers. Let's make that clear. Um, <laughs> but there in one city in my district is exactly 50-50 split. 
politically. There have been newspaper articles and stories written about the, the fact that this city is exactly 50-50 split. I always win that city by about 65%. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I have Republicans that, because I'm, I'm very visible in my district and very accessible, they'll support me. But they're not the ones that are the fringe. <laughs> These are actual real, old time real Republicans, not this current crop of Republicans. Yeah, there, there was a, an article <clears throat> recently in the New York Times that pointed out that every year, four million people turn 18 and they can vote. And though that that cohort, all the way up to about 40 or something, uh, voted for Biden by it whopping 27 points. And they're voting more than they've ever voted before. And and every year, two and a half million people die. And that is the largest cohort of, of you know, Trumpers. And so over the time period from his election in 2016 to 2024, there's a 52 million vote turnover in American politics. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to save us in the end? I think so. Um, I think exactly what you're talking about, you know, the turnover, people, um, it's called attrition, people passing away. Uh, and then, you know, the younger people coming forward, this last election in April in Wisconsin, it was that age group, college students, mm -hmm. that gave us that big win. And I do think, and it's I've been trying to do this, because I'll, besides being a legislator, I'm also chair of my county Democratic Party. So I've been trying to, to figure out ways to get more people, young people, involved and paying attention and voting so i'm i'm trying to figure out a way to get into the high schools and create some type of uh civic groups that you know um because we don't teach civics in the schools anymore but we need to get to these young people and you know get him get them interested and active and you know, get them to the point where they actually care about what's going on in their communities. So that's one of the projects that I've been working on. But it's it's a long, tough project. <laughs> I recently had a uh, former senior White House staffer, Rob Hausman, underneath Bill Clinton uh, on the show. And he shared two things that I wanted to get your perspective on. Uh, one is he thought that, you know, it's such a shame that we lose good talent after, you know, eight years what if we do, you know, have eight on, eight off, or eight on, four off, and then have the ability, if the people chose it, to bring on uh, a past uh, present, and especially if they were good and, and could help the country. Mm -hmm. The other is he was a proponent um, on his own champion for like a third or fourth party. Um, he thought with all of the discourse that that would be a solution to this. What are your thoughts on those? Things Let's go to the first one first. I mean, I do like the concept of, you know, so you serve your eight years in the White House, um, you take four years off, you can run again. Because, I mean, it's, I'll tell you, that was my dream when, you know, Barack Obama finished his term. I was like, oh, I wish he could run in four years again. Um, but, of course, our Constitution doesn't allow that. Um, but I would... I think that would be a really interesting concept because um, if someone, if if the American people perceive that somebody has done a heck of a job running this country, why not give them another chance? You know, um, and um, oh, the third party. <laughs> That's going to be very tough to do. Um, I right now I'm not a fan of third parties unless they are actually going to be a true third party and be organized. Because right now, um, we are a two party country, and a third party has no chance of winning the White House. And all it's going to do is peel votes away from basically Democrats. Um, so I mean, it's it's a great concept if it could ever really happen and be successful. I don't know. I don't know. 
Can I get the opinion of uh, Robert and Phyllis on that though? I, I strongly agree with uh, Christine that uh, the, the we we have the deeply embedded uh, two party system, and uh, the third parties are are spoilers basically. And, mm -hmm. and you look at at uh, uh, reason Al Gordon get elected uh, was was a third party move, and and, and these mm -hmm. green parties and uh, you know were you know that their their function is is basically just and that's what they're setting them up for this. Uh, no labels gimmick. Um, yeah. It's just that's that's nothing but a but a front to 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 take votes with the Democrats and um, you know with Joe Manchin and and, and company and uh, so it, it's scary to me because uh, a lot of people will believe that this is some kind of alternative or something and and it's a way of you know and people who are very discouraged and don't will like either side you know can use that as a as a venting thing a vent a venting a frustration right. but it's it to start talking about it as a legitimate alternative to government is just unrealistic we, it, it's just not going to happen i mean not in our lifetime i mean the way things are set up um, and some of these things like bringing back the president's a great idea, and I agree with it, but like Christine says, it, it, you have to amend the Constitution, and, and that ain't going to happen. So uh, we have to kind of, you know, you know, is, is um, uh, one of those, I forgot who it was that said this, you know, you, you go to war with the army you got, not the army you wish you had. And, and um, you know, we have to deal with the political realities that are in front of us now, you know, and not the ones that we wish we had. And mm -hmm. So I, I I agree with Christine. It's it's not it's not uh, it's not a feasible or it's dangerous is what I think it is. Yeah, Phyllis. Yeah, well, you know I I don't have a specific opinion about that. I, you know I wish we had more voices, is what I really wish, and I wish that we had more voices so that we had the wisdom and the experience of many points of view. Um, to me, that's really what we need. I don't know if that looks like more parties or what it looks like, but I think there are so many points of view that need to be heard in this country, um, and we don't all have them. You know, none of us holds all of those necessary points of view. Science has a point of view. Education has a point mm -hmm. of view has a point of view. And what we really need is the desire to sit down and hear the best that we all have to offer. Um, but we're really far from that. So I don't know the way there. But I do want to just speak to one thing that Christine said when she said that she doesn't really have hope that necessarily that she'll be heard in the legislature, but she talks so that the populace, so that the people that she represents and anyone listening will hear her message. And that's what I, that's why I say education, inform people. That's why I wrote my book. I hope young people will read my book. I hope there'll be a movement at some point to have psychology and family dynamics be taught in the schools as as an you know an important element of our education it's 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 so missing you know on so many levels and it's yet the all the problems in human relations that we're suffering from fall you, know, I, <clears throat> you know the, 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 you know i think that that this back to this original thing we were talking about earlier about morality in the schools is a is a is a subject matter you can't call it that because people you know but it, you know and to get it as far away from as you can from religion and politics you call it something like citizenship or uh, mm -hmm. or good manners you know we we want to teach children manners you know or or in in citizenship uh, that's what we would call it to, to get people and and we keep it away from politics you know and you know you, you give your seat to the elderly woman who comes onto the bus if you're 19 years old and don't cut in line and then you extrapolate that out into normal you you you, you don't call your, your 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 neighbors names you know you don't call the people then that generalizes out to how you treat your political opponents and, and what you know the, these very mm -hmm. studies show that if you if you tell people enough that your opponents are really really horrible people, uh, which is what we're getting right now, then you think they deserve to be treated horribly. You lose, and what's what's happened now is that the Republicans don't believe that the Democrats are a legitimate party. They're not even if they get elected, it is not legitimate, and it is completely legitimate to block them and to deny to, right. to, to deny democracy is what Christine has to deal with on a daily basis. I'm just saying that is an abuse dynamic. That is an abuse of power. 
It's abuse of people. And that's what's being role modeled is abuse is okay. And we know what happens. We know what's happened historically when that has been, you know, just look at Germany, Nazi Germany. It, but it's happened all historically all over the world and at many different times when abuse and neglect and horrible tortures treatment of other human beings is legitimized and legislated and we're we're in danger well, I put that, just put, to, put, real quick robert just to say teach it as psychology that's a, that's another neutral name yeah. for what we're talking about here is to teach people proper behavior that will you nest has to have in a democracy yeah but Absolutely. in and I throw one thing in really quick, not because it's right or wrong, but because it actually serves people. We do better in that climate. It's okay to say it's right or wrong. I, I, yeah. I think, you know, that, I, you know, there are still universally held, you know, it, people universally believe it's it's rude and wrong to, but to, to, to break into lines and, and we can generalize that to a lot of other behaviors. But when, once you start with, with this notion that there is appropriate behavior, there are standards, that, that's what's, you know, is there's no longer standards. There's no longer these ideals and, you know, that, that we had for, for centuries in this country about rectitude and what's appropriate. And, and we, we reintroduce the notion that there are norms in society that are universal and the Republicans and the Democrats both believe in them and they restrain the most you know, unseemly types of behavior. And, and I think we can get at that by calling it, as you suggest, Phyllis, um, you, know, you know, psychology or, or uh, mental health. Mental health. Right. Mental health, yes. Well, it, the mental health suggests, uh, you know, I, I like your say, calling it psychology is a more neutral sounding, you know, in, in psychology, citizenship and good manners, uh, you know, can be a, a course we teach with reading, writing and arithmetic. You certainly did when I was in school, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, Johnny, you don't talk to your friend like that. And, and you know, pe people people got it and, and they carried forward a, a sense of personal propriety mm -hmm. and ethics that was a centerpiece as as Brooks details and great, you know, was a centerpiece of American psychology and American behavior for two centuries. You know, we were obsessed with morality. And, and being proper and right, you know, and now it's just gone and we're hurting for it. You know, I'd like to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, Christine's got a busy schedule and, and I appreciate the time she's given mm -hmm. today. I'd like to give her the floor with some final words, any kind of message or words you'd like to spread for listeners. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me today. Um, I've, I've actually learned a lot and have, have enjoyed it, but I guess the message would be you know, we're all humans. I think I think it was Phyllis that said that. We're all humans. Um, we all have feelings. We all care about certain things. We may have a different approach to different things, but it's not a reason to be hateful. Um, some, sometimes all you got to do is try to sit down and have a discussion. Absolutely. Christine, let, let me say in closing here that, that you as a legislature, you're underpaid, you're underappreciated, and, and the work that you do is vital, and, and I you. want to thank you. We all thank you for your service. Thank you. I, thank you. I enjoy what I do, so <laughs> thank you. This has been Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany, exploring deep stories from real-life guests with real-life experiences providing insight to our listeners with every story. Stay up to date on future podcasts by bookmarking Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany.podbean.com and follow Bo on social media by searching Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. Have an idea for a future story? Send your idea to acrmadison at gmail.com. Until next time, grab life by the horns and keep inspiring others.